We are in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. These are verses 15 through 20. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So with this study, we are concluding our, our look at the Gospel of Mark. Along the way, we have used this first of the written accounts of Jesus as our guide, consulting the other Gospels for additional details. This final lesson concerns the final commands of our Lord prior to his ascension into heaven. Jesus had previously told his disciples to leave Jerusalem and to gather in Galilee to meet him there. Paul wrote of this and of other appearances of Jesus in his first letter to the church of Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8, let me read them. Paul wrote, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. We know the story of the blinding glory of Jesus that met Paul on that road to Damascus. And then when Paul wrote this some 25 years later, most of these eyewitnesses, hundreds of eyewitnesses were still alive and testifying that they had seen Jesus preaching to them. Probably it was on that appointed mountaintop in Galilee. And perhaps it was in Galilee that James, the brother of Jesus, saw and finally believed. By this point in Mark's story, Jesus had appeared to many people beginning first in Jerusalem. Why the Pentecost did not immediately happen after the resurrection, why the Holy Ghost did not instantly fall upon the early church, and why Jesus did not immediately begin his rule over the earth, and why he made them leave Jerusalem and go into Galilee and then return to Jerusalem to wait, all of those are good questions. Why are we still waiting for him to return? I often have questions that are difficult to answer. I only know that all of the answers are to be found in the unfolding will of Almighty God. He will accomplish his perfect will. And he will save the predestined souls of fallen humanity from sin and death in his way and in his time. He said, it is not by might, it is not by power, but by my spirit. In those first days and weeks, the apostles and disciples were not ready. And remaining in Jerusalem was dangerous. The crowds of Passover were leaving. We know that some two, maybe three million people were in Jerusalem at that time, and they had been afraid to take Jesus during the day when he was openly preaching in the temple because they were afraid that the crowds would turn around and stone them to death. So they grabbed him at night in the Garden of Gethsemane, betrayed by Judas, and they were ready to grab the apostles too. Now, there would be no protection for the hunted followers of Jesus. And also, presented with the facts of the resurrection, there were still some incredible adjustments to this supernatural reality that these frail 
individuals had to make. It was hard to believe even when they had seen. At one point it said, and they believed not for joy. They were afraid it was too good to be true. So some time and some distance were needed. God had a plan to prepare the church for our great commission. That is to say, the mighty works of telling the story of Jesus to the entire world. And that plan was so that all might freely repent of sin and choose life everlasting through the Lord rather than choosing damnation. It is not an easy thing to wait upon the Lord. The disciples did go to Galilee. Jesus met with the eleven prior to that great gathering of the five hundred, but before that, I think they grew tired of waiting at the foot of that mountain by the shore of the sea, none more so than their natural leader, that bold and petulant uh, giant of a man, Peter. He was a man of action, and he needed to take his mind off of problems and questions too big and complex for his straightforward way of thinking. He grew weary of praying and waiting and thinking and waiting and waiting and waiting. And John picks up the tale in John 21. I'll read you verses 1 through 13. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a-fishing, they say unto him. We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's cloak unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came up in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were two hundred cubits dragging the net with the fishes. As soon as they were come on to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three, and for all that there were so many, yet not was the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and die. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. This was much like that time at the beginning of his ministry when Jesus provided them with a miraculous haul of fish. Who but Jesus could command such signs and wonders? John continued his remarkable story of how Jesus at last made that great fisherman a fisherman of men. John 21, verses 14 through 17. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. So when they had died, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? More than these. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, 
Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Peter, who had thrice denied Jesus on the night of his unlawful arrest and trials, wept to think of his three fearful denials. But now he thrice affirmed his love for Jesus and took on the mantle of shepherding the lambs and sheep of his master's flock. If more pastors and churches would realize what this relationship really is and what it must be, and if more of us committed ourselves as Peter did, we would be living in a different world than this. To feed the lambs of the Savior is not merely to preach some scriptures at them once a week. It means conducting them from safe place to safe place, protecting them and nurturing them, caring for them, and doing it out of love for them and for their master. It is not merely employment, wielding executive authority over a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. What have we turned the flocks and the shepherds of Jesus Christ into? John tells us that Peter heard more of what being the first pastor of the church would mean. I imagine that the sound of the waves of the Galilee lapping up on the shore were drowned out by the pounding of his heart as Jesus spoke these next words. In verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. To follow Jesus is to follow the Son of God to the cross. You may never have to carry a wooden cross. You may never be carried to one. But do not doubt that to follow Jesus is to take up his cross. We must each day present ourselves a living sacrifice unto the Lord God Almighty. We have to die to ourselves as Christians and live for him when we do. Amazingly, we truly find not only our true everlasting selves, but we also find not despair and death, but life filled with abundant joy and completion. It is a supernatural thing. It may be mundane and ordinary to outward appearances. Not every miracle that God does is some lightning on the mountaintop experience, but it is miraculous nevertheless, and it is experienced by the born again when they live by faith rather than by sight. The blessed assurance and comfort of the Holy Spirit is ours when we follow Jesus and deny ourselves. Mark explains how Jesus gave marching orders to the church, and we call those orders the Great Commission, and that isn't what a salesman receives after a big sale. The realtors laughed at that. The Great Commission. It's what we are about. It's what we've been about for 2,000 years. In the course of it, we are to take the gospel everywhere throughout the world. In the course of it, many miraculous things have happened. Demons have been cast out. Certain death has been defied, poisoned by nature or by man. The harm that might come to those who follow Jesus is sometimes averted and avoided in ways that we cannot understand and that science cannot explain. I don't believe in tempting the Lord God. 
But if it will bring glory to Jesus for people to see Paul struck by a deadly snake and not be harmed, then glory will be brought to Jesus. But there were many times when Paul took a beating. Finally, he lost his head. Jesus promised miracles, but he didn't promise them on demand, and he didn't promise to protect daredevils. So make sure you are following Jesus and be wary of any thrill-sneaking snake handler. You okay with that? Matthew tells us that they followed Jesus to a high place, and it was not to jump off. They were led there to be told again that there was a worldwide mission awaiting them. In Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. If we follow Jesus, we will not remain in one place. Even if we never leave the little city or county where we were born throughout all of our lives, as so many Christians through the years have lived very local lives, but even if we stay rooted to the same spot, we aren't standing still if we follow him. He will lead us to greater and purer holiness unto God if we follow him. The disciple of Jesus should not remain a milk-fed Christian baby only concerned with what the church can do for them, but instead the disciple is one who is growing and maturing and moving on as they follow Jesus, serving and discipling others. The original disciples did not remain in the safety and familiarity of Galilee. They were following Jesus, and the time had come for them to move on. Let me take you to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, beginning in verse 50. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. In the Gospels, we are only given the briefest report that Jesus ascended into the sky and beyond. Mark tells us that he was received into the very throne room of heaven where he is seated at the right hand of God. This is a position which, in an earthly kingdom, signifies the greatest possible honor. No one sits in the presence of the king unless they are of the same standing as the king. And the one who is placed on the right hand of the king is honored above all others in the kingdom. So it is that Jesus is honored to be at the right hand of Almighty God because he alone is worthy. He is seated in the presence of God because he and the Father and the Spirit are one. The most complete report that we have of the ascension of Jesus to glory and of the great commission he has given the church, Luke recounts in the book of Acts. In chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto his apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. That incredible indwelling of the Holy Spirit was yet to come. This empowered the apostles and those 120 disciples to change the world and change the world they did. The work of the Holy Spirit still continues in us and through us and will 
until the final day when the kingdom is restored. All the prophecies of the reign of the Messiah that the Jews had been looking forward to will be fulfilled when he returns. We think, we hope, that day might be near. Even while some of us in this room are still breathing, we will yet be breathing when that happens. Precisely when our Lord will return and when this will happen is a matter of speculation and a matter of interest for the born again, and it has been since the beginning of the church. Acts 1, chapter 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And this is the heart of that mighty job of the church that we call the Great Commission. The uttermost part of the world evidently still lies before us, but it is not far now. This gospel will be told everywhere. We are so close. One day the last soul will be born again, and our centuries of labor will come to an end. Perhaps it will even be before the sun sets today. We've worked toward that moment for 20 centuries. The day when Jesus returns as he left. In verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath's day journey. There's been much said, and there is much to say, about the return of Jesus, how the dead in Christ shall rise, and in the twinkling of an eye, we will be caught up to meet them in the air, going to our Lord. At that time, we shall know Jesus as we are known. We shall attend that great marriage feast of Christ and the church. We will receive names from Jesus by which we shall be known throughout all eternity. We will be judged for our Christian life and rewarded according to our faithfulness. Those rewards will be as glimmering crowns of heavenly light resting upon our brows. Some of us may have only the faintest glowing circlet, having been saved, but not redeeming our time. However, we were gifted, living lives barely different from the worldly population surrounding us. I have a friend who is very worldly. I'm convinced he's saved. <laughs> He says, I'm going to just be a street sweeper up there. Some crowns will gleam with a more pure and a brighter radiance, that of those who lived for Jesus and who made life a bit more heavenly for all who knew them. There will be some few who truly gave Jesus absolutely everything, even their lives. They shall have the martyr's crown that is only given to those who died for Jesus and for the gospel. The transcendent brilliance of those crowns may be a display of such beauty that it will make the rest of us just weep to gaze upon it, realizing our own comparative dimness is due to our own lack of faith, our own sins, our own failures, our own omissions. We will certainly weep on that day a day of judgment and reward. Even those who are most richly rewarded will think on how short they themselves fell of the righteousness and worthiness of Jesus. 
they will weep until they hear the Lord say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Many tears will be wiped away on that day, never to be shed again. A great and unstoppable and everlasting joy will well up within our glorified forms. And however great our rewards, however brightly may shine the glory of our crowns, we will all of us cast that reward before the feet of he alone who is worthy, he alone who earned reward. As these things take place, it is written that a great tribulation will have been rolling by on the earth below with no church to pray for the leaders of the world, with no church to bind Jerusalem in peace, with no church to loose prosperity in the nations, with no church to be salt to preserve and light to shine, the devil will have his day. And all things will reach a point beyond which, if it continues, no living soul would remain upon a dead and desolate earth, silent and empty, save for the spiteful laughter of Satan. That is his plan. And that day will never be. For it is then written that we will ride. We will mount up on the white war horses of heavenly triumph. We will be arrayed with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, as he takes his throne to rule over all the nations, making of the earth a paradise for a thousand years while Satan is bound in chains before the final end to an accursed earth shall come. The great judgment shall then take place, the second judgment, the one that we don't have to sit through, the one that Jesus exempts us from. And once the elements themselves melt with a fervent heat and when all have been judged and consigned to a hellacious eternal death or welcomed into a glorious everlasting life, we are given a still more incredible vision of a new heaven and a new earth. It's a glorious description that may stir our hearts, but it is more than our imaginations and our dreams can make of it. We don't know when this age ends and when that age begins. Jesus was quite clear we won't know the time, but we are to watch and we are to be ready when the season is upon us. If our observations and measurements and estimates are anywhere near correct, we know that the time may very well be at hand. Nevertheless, we cannot know the day or the hour, but we can be ready. And it is our job to make as much of the entire world ready as possible. We draw closer. So let's continue. Let's not falter here at the end of this race. Let's follow Jesus who is with us always, even unto the end of this age. And let us work in that great commission to hasten that day so that we might with our living eyes see the Son of God return in glory and power to take us and all who we love with him to our eternal reward.